Hi everyone, you've chosen a really exciting day to join us because I'm here with Michael Chang, the co-founder of Snipply. Snipply is empowering brands and thought leaders to benefit from content sharing. Thanks so much for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So you guys started Snipply about a year ago, and since then you've generated 50 million clicks, which is pretty cool. So yeah. Can we start out and just pretend that you're giving me a product demo? Sure, sure. Um, so the idea really came about when uh, somebody asked me at a previous startup, you're spending all this time sharing content, but well, what's the return on investments? Why are you doing it? Uh, and I realized that when you're sharing content, I may be driving a thousand clicks to a list on BuzzFeed, maybe a cool article on TechCrunch, but at the end of the day, I, I don't know whether or not it's worth my time. And I'm generating clicks to third-party content. Um, and we realize that you know businesses are sharing content not for fun. They share it to build thought leadership, to build a following, ultimately to drive conversion to their business, to their marketing campaigns, whether it's a nonprofit donation or a consultancy wants somebody to fill out their contact form. Uh, and we realize that there needs to be a conversion opportunity for sharing content to have a tangible return on investments. So with Snipply, we created a simple little technology that allows you to overlay and add your own little message to shared content. So let's say I, uh, I'm a travel agency and I send out a BuzzFeed article of places you need to visit this year. Well, instead of just sending that and you drool over the photo and move on, um, you can add a call to action that says, these are definitely places that you should travel to and we can take you there. Click here and let us tell you more. So uh, allowing really for the content share to make a clear association between why are they sharing the article and immediately giving the viewer an, an option, an action to take for them to do something. And a lot of times you read an article, there's links everywhere. You may not have the attention span or really the time to figure out what you should do. And a clear call to action is our approach to solving that problem. Right, so they say that you can only leave your audience with one thing when you pitch them. What's the one-liner I should remember about Snipply? Well, I think, uh, I think it's all about ROI. Um, and maybe it's not one word, but return on investment mm -hmm. might be three, so I'm cheating here. Um, but it's, it, it is ROI at the end of the day. It's getting recognition for sharing. Um, it's getting rewarded for sharing. It's, it's having something in return with all the time that you're spending on content curation. It's conversion through curation. So I would say ROI is a huge component of that. Oh, I like the conversion through curation. I might yeah. have to choose that one. That was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, conversion through curation. Tell me about your conversion rates because you guys have been hugely successful so far. Yeah, so conversion rates we've seen really differs. Uh, I would say average, a healthy conversion rate could be anywhere between 5 to 15 percent. Uh, but I've seen companies as high as upwards of 30 percent or as low as 0.1 uh, percent. So that's why I think the average doesn't really matter as much because I think it depends on the call to action. It's like a, think of a Google ad, right? It doesn't really matter what the average industry conversion is because the way you write the ad it has so much of an impact. So if you're giving away free ebooks or free gifts, um, people are going to click on the call to action. If you have a static call to action that's not necessarily related to the content and it's generic, it might say, uh, to learn more about our company, click here. But the article is talking about something unrelated or seemingly unrelated to your industry. Um, there's going to be very few clicks on it. And so what we've seen is that it's heavily dependent on uh, how people use it and what they're offering. That goes directly into a question we have from our audience for you, Michael, it's from Liza B. And she's curious about your take on the future of content sharing and how is Snipply going to impact that? So I think the future of content sharing um, is interesting. If you, look at, uh, if you look at the early days of the Google search engine, right? It's, um, people were hesitant. Um, should, we, should we allow Google to index our website? What does that mean? Do we want to be found on search engines? Uh, and so, as, you, as everyone knows now, Search Engine has become a very, very integrated part of content publishing. It's how people are found, people look into SEO. Um, I think a new era is, is upon us um, when, when it comes to content because people are looking less to SEO now and more towards organic reach. How do I get people to share my content more? How do I leverage social? Uh, and even though social media is you know, it's not like it was invented yesterday, I think its impact is becoming more and more profound. So you look at uh, the way we consume content these days. 
it's on news feeds, right? Very rarely do we subscribe to New York Times or, or BuzzFeed or some of those websites that people share. Um, but nonetheless, we're subscribed to them, quote unquote, because we're subscribed to our friends. And we follow our friends and what they read, we read and so forth. And that creates a whole chain reaction. And so subscri- the nature of subscription has changed. Uh, so if, let's say I want content from Mashable. Instead of actually signing up for Mashable's uh, mailing list, I might like Mashable's Facebook page so they can feed me content via social and retweets and shares and so forth. Uh, so sharing is is really the new SEO in my view. And, and there's a lot of tools in the ecosystem that has enabled that. You look at Hootsuite, you look at Buffer, you look at a lot of those tools that has just made content sharing so much easier. And that has accelerated the sheer volume of content that's being shared and the impact that it's having on the industry. Um, and so that's that's where I see uh, the, the future of content is growing. And that's why we position Snipply the way we did is because we do believe that sharing is a huge component. Um, so how then do we transform the experience? How do we personalize a link because now it's not it's not just the link that you find on the Google search engine it's a link that somebody specific is sharing to you it's content curation how do we how do we up that game and how do we add some interesting angle to it so that everyone benefits um, through incentivized sharing you're much more likely to share if your incentives are in line with the publisher that you also have something to gain uh, from driving traffic to that site so one thing I want to shift gears to is your marketing because you guys don't have a marketing budget and it's all about having people pay attention to you at the right time. You haven't decided to go for a venture and you guys have received a ton of press so far. Mm-hmm. And I think that really comes into how much you care about your customers. <laughs> Thank you, so, yes. Tell me more about that and how you guys are driving so much coverage without the traditional marketing budget. Yeah, so I, um, I mean, this is a very deeply philosophical debate on how businesses grow. And um, so as a team, we've always believed in focusing on the few. So if we had a few customers, we would just focus on delivering uh, an awesome experience to those five people on our platform as opposed to gaining more. And so that's partly because of what we believe in and also because of our, uh, as you said, the, the resources limitation. We don't have the option to pursue marketing. Um, because we didn't have venture funding and simply it's kind of a crazy idea and it's hard to raise money on, on something that's uh, too far-fetched a lot of times. So, um, you know, when, when we try to explain Snipply and imagine you as an investor trying to wrap your head around Snipply before it existed, mm. how hard it is to understand without a visual demo. Um, uh, and so we, we decided to go the route of building our own minimum viable product. Um, very organically, we put it up on Reddit and Hacker News, a lot of those um, really viral forums where people talk and discuss. And uh, it so did go viral. Yeah, and from the very foundations of our product development cycle, it was, okay, how do we incorporate the feedback from Reddit? And this is feedback from users before they even sign up for a platform. How do we incorporate that feedback to make a product better? Uh, and so since then, it's always been, um, you know, let's not, let's not have an ego as entrepreneur and feel like we know what to do. Because we're building this for marketing professionals. And although we're technology entrepreneurs, we're not necessarily marketing professionals. So at the end of the day, it's the marketers, it's the businesses and the marketing teams that know what they want. And a lot of the insights that I've derived from the future of the industry, where things are going, uh, that has developed because of the time I spend every single day with our users. Uh, And it's not like I come from a 10-year background of online marketing, but the people who use Snipply do. They have their 10, 20 years. They've seen where the industry has been. They see where the industry is going. So it, it works on two sides when we work with customers. Not only do we get a ton of feedback and wisdom that we can inject back into the product development cycle, but also just learning, just learning about the industry, understanding how it works. And uh, that's always worked for us. And another advantage to building really great experiences is people tend to like to share that. People write blog posts about Snipply. And I think as of today, uh, we probably have over 100 blog posts that are written about us. Uh, and those, you, you just can't, there's no amount of money can buy genuine reviews when people are happy about your product. Uh, and people are happy about your product when, uh, you, usually the, the happiest people about your product are the people who are unhappiest about your product, who says, mm-hmm. 
you know what, this is missing, this isn't for me. And you take the time to reach out and you say, well, wait a minute, you know, we're doing this full time. You don't like it. We have eight hours a day, 10 hours a day to, to make you like it, right? to shape the product in a way that's more usable for you. Uh, and we, of course, it was more feasible at the time when we would do it for a couple people. Um, now we kind of try to do it in aggregate. Uh, you know, 60% of the people want this. And so we should prioritize this over a feature that 30% of people want, 40%, you know, and so forth. Uh, but we always try to do that, to let the user feedback prioritize the features for us, let the users define the product roadmap for us. And that, in turn, has generated uh, a lot of love for the way we do things and what we do here at Snipley. One of the ways you put it in one of your blogs that I really enjoyed is that you want customers, so if I use Snipply, you actually want me to feel like I'm on the product development team. Like I right. could send you an email, say, hey Mike, I'm working on this right now and it's just not a smooth transition. Can you help me out? What right. are some ways that when you're having that conversation with the customer, you get the most out of it? Because a lot of times customers don't know what their problem is, you have to fish it out of them. Yeah, I think I think it, it starts by really admitting that you're a human being. And I think a lot of companies, um, they, they're a company, and there's a clear distinction between the way we talk to a logo and a person. Uh, and a lot of the communication that I start off with, and I believe it's fully in the responsibility of the, the team to reach out to the people for feedback. And I always start with, uh, you know, we work really hard on this product, uh, and we know it's not perfect. You know what, to be honest, it's filled with bugs, uh, and I'm sure they're everywhere. We're working on fixing them. Uh, so if you find any, right, if you have any suggestions for making this even better, please let us know. So the, our, our approach from the very beginning is admitting very honestly and genuinely that our product is imperfect by nature, that there's a lot of room for improvement, uh, and that we do need help. And I think that's the biggest thing. You look at a company like Google, you don't, it, it, it doesn't strike you as they need help. Um, they're doing okay <laughs> they're doing okay we've always positioned ourselves as a team that needs help and we are we're a small team and um, we're, we don't have millions of dollars in venture financing so we do need help and in many ways we've grown because of the people who've helped us and so that's that's something that we've continued in our company culture as it grew when it comes to company culture I think that's one of the most important things of customer experience because you love Snipply you founded this company. Your co-founders love Snipply. They're also founders. Today versus in a few years when Snipply is huge, you're employing hundreds, thousands of employees. How are you going to make sure that that love for the customer remains because you have it right now because you're so close to it. This is your baby. Right. I think, um, so I've always believed that company culture both externally and internally should be a good match. Mm -hmm. So you know, what the customer feels should be the same as what the employees of the company feel, that we're hiring because we're a company that needs help, that, you know, do not feel free to reach out to the founders or your colleagues when you are in need of assistance and that we're all passionate about the product. Uh, and we would like to hire people like that as well. And I think a lot of sustaining a certain level of customer experience or brand experience has a lot to do with the people you hire and more importantly the mentality that you grant for the people who come in through the doors um, and so if we if we act like we need help and we're genuine externally but internally we're arrogant and ignorant um, that's that's gonna fall apart as you scale but if we can sustain that company culture internally and that people truly feel the way we do, then I believe as we expand, we can sustain that. So expansion is definitely on the horizon for you guys. And one of the biggest things that people say in the startup community is, once you start getting bigger, don't go hiring tons of people. Make it worth work with who you have and hire slowly. How are you feeling about that right now? Where are you guys with that? Generally, I, I'm uh, I'm a fan of hiring slowly, mm -hmm. um, and that's one of the one of the reasons why we didn't go for venture financing in the early days. Because if you know if you give me ten million dollars today and I'm forced to hire forty people in the next week, uh, you create a lot of room for for error for hiring the wrong people. Um, and so I, I believed in hiring slowly because of company culture specifically and how, how important it is for our company especially because our user acquisition doesn't come from dollar spent. It comes from sustaining the experience and the brand. 
Uh, and so it's even more important for us to hire slowly to make sure that the people we bring on board, number one, are innately somewhat of a culture fit and giving us the time to be able to um, really, really show them what we're all about and see if they're a good fit. So I'm in the camp of hiring slowly. But um, I don't think that should be taken as, as absolute advice because there are circumstances where, for example, let's say you're in a very highly competitive space uh, where you're kind of go, going for a space race kind of thing and, and speed is important and it is about pumping talent, raw engineers, you know, throwing bodies at a problem and a lot of times businesses do have to do that. Snipley is in a unique position because we're, we're a first mover, you know, we've opened up a new market. There's not a, it's not everywhere that you see this similar kind of service. So we have the advantage of you know, having the luxury of taking things slowly. And I don't think many other sectors have the same luxuries to really get things right. Mike, do you think you really have that luxury, though? Can you have that luxury in the startup world to move slowly? You can't have that luxury, but there's degrees, <laughs> right? Degrees, there's more okay. luxury than others. Um, and, and while this space is less competitive, it gives us the opportunity to build a stronger foundation, which then makes it harder for other people to come in in the future. Uh, whereas if we speed through it now, we could risk uh, a weak foundation. And be when, you're, when you're a first mover, um, the, the, the fears are different. So let's say you're in a competitive space, you're fighting against other startups, which are all also very nimble, moving very quickly. When you're a first mover, the, the fear then comes in, okay, well, we're not afraid of other startups, but what if Google does this? Right? What, if, what, if, uh, what if Apple does this? Or what if you know, some, some, some like Hootsuite or even Bitly would do this? Um, so, so that's why the foundation is important. The only way you can overcome other companies leveraging a larger user base on you is if you have a very strong foundation, a very strong experience, uh, and more focus than a bigger company could ever put into a subset of their products. Uh, so that's always been our thinking around why we do what we do. I like it. You have me convinced. <laughs> I want to shift gears now and I want to talk about your experience with Y Combinator. As I shared before, I really admired that your team was so open about your experience. You guys applied after only being live for four weeks. You got the interview. And then after you did the interview, you didn't get accepted. And you actually went and publicized your application and you publicized a transcript of the interview. Right. What possessed you to do that? I think it's the same company culture you see in everything else we do, which is, okay, we got into Y Combinator. We need help. Right? We have no idea how to interview for this thing. Here's our applications. Here's how we got in. Uh, and a lot of people did reach out. And we reached out to every YC alum that we could find on, on interview tips. And, you know, and, and, and again, it's, it's really the way we do things. It's, there's nothing to be proud of to, 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 there's nothing to be proud of to get an interview. And there's no shame in not getting the interview. What's important to us is the learning and the feedback and how that can contribute to, to how we grow and adapt. And so the same reason we shared the application was the same reason we shared our interview experience, which was, you know, we screwed up. You know, hello world, we screwed up. This is how we screwed up. Because um, you don't want to say, I screwed up, how can, we, how can I do better? Nobody really knows the, how you screwed up, which is what's most important. Uh, and we wanted to be very specific. This is exactly how it went down. This is exactly how we screwed up. Um, how can we do better next time? And so a lot of these things aren't necessarily intentional uh, planned out ahead. We, we seek help as we always do. Um, but of course, those two activities actually drove a lot of attention to the company uh, and, and created kind of our early batch of users, of, of really helpful users because they're startup entrepreneurs. So they understand what we're going through. They understand the importance of product feedback. Uh, and that early user group helped us a lot in acquiring what would then eventually become our current target, which are marketers and marketing teams. And so everything has kind of evolved and fallen into place step by step organically. When it comes to that idea of being vulnerable, I certainly don't think that it is common in the startup community. And you've spoken about that and it's just generally known that you want to come out being confident. This is an amazing product. We're going to serve you like no one else is. And right. I think that there's pros and cons of both. But how do you find a balance between not being vulnerable and asking for help too much that I don't trust the product. Right. I think uh, it's, so it's not easy, 
first of all, I want to put it out there. It's, it's, uh, I think there's a difference, lacking confidence and uh, needing help. I think you can have a lot of confidence and enough confidence in, or, or self-awareness, I guess you can say, to know your limits and know your limitations. Uh, I've always believed that people are smart. Right? People are generally smart, uh, especially if you're talking to investors or other entrepreneurs. And if you show a false sense of confidence and overhype a product, people can see straight through it. And uh, just from experience, they've seen enough entrepreneurs who boast and and you know hype up their own startups to to identify trends and know who's for real and who isn't. Um, and but for us, you know, it's it's not that we're not confident in our products; it's that we're confident in the fact that this can be much more successful if we humble ourselves and get the help that we need. Uh, and overall, I think it's a better experience. Right? It just feels better to, to work together with people as opposed to competitively or trying to appear greater. Um, and I think vulnerability is the way I look at it. It's just being human. It's being honest to yourself and being honest to the people around you. And a lot of times that's reciprocated. Uh, if, you, if you're willing to do that, show the more human side of yourself that's when other people are willing to open up, uh, not only help you, but build meaningful relationships and connections. Whereas if I come on very strong and, and really confident, people are going to react the same way. Uh, and I'm going to end up having a network of people who are all really strong and confident and, and talking about themselves. And that's not really the type of entrepreneurial network that I want to build for myself. Uh, and of course, that's permeated in the way we run our business as well and the branding of the team. But that's kind of the, the grounds and roots of where that comes from. So you discuss how you want to be known as an entrepreneur. And like we said before, you've had your hand in 12 startups, which is a big number. <laughs> and you're incredibly passionate about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship in Canada. Tell us a little bit about your journey pre-Snipley, at Snipley, and what really gets you excited about being an entrepreneur? Yeah, I, I think um, the, the sheer diversity of what you get to do on a day-to-day -day basis as an entrepreneur, which is literally limitless. I, mean, I, could, I could jump from coding to cold calling. Uh, and most people don't do those two things hand in hand, but I, I can do that from Monday to Tuesday, a completely different thing. Uh, and I started picking up my fascination with entrepreneurship at a very early age, which is why the number is a bit higher. And by no means are they all successful. I mean, it, I think a part of being honest to yourself is acknowledging that okay 12 startups well, a lot of them have failed and that's okay uh, because it's it's part of the learning it's a part of the growth process but I've, I've also seen across different businesses pre-snipply and post-snipply um, the, the, the things that you do to grow a company is substantially different depending on the company that you're growing and so not only can you within a single company do completely different things in any given week when you're working on a new company you're doing a completely different set of things. Uh, and so if you, if you look at some of the startups that I've played with in the past, they, they range everywhere from digital products to, to service cars. To to cars. And the, the nature is very different. Um, and some, something that I really hold close to my heart is the idea of innovation being at the intersection of different fields. And so the, that concept is, um, you know, if you spent 30 years in a single industry, you're going to see things a certain way. But somebody from a different industry might jump in and say, oh, well, that's weird. Why don't you just do this that way? Uh, and a lot of times people who spend too much time looking at a single problem have a hard time seeing the problem from a different perspective. So having, having been in different industries and taking learnings from one to another, uh, I think has a lot to do with creativity and innovation and being able to look at a problem uh, and, and just approach it in a completely different way that people have in the past. And I think Snipley is a great example. And people share content all the time. For years, I'm sure marketing teams are always figuring out ways to improve their conversion. But because you look at a problem for so long, you're, you're looking at, okay, if we want to improve marketing, let's improve SEO. How do we improve our page rank? How do we, how do we write better call to action? But the fresh perspective would be, oh, where do you put this call to action? Mm -hmm. uh, what, what happens after page rank? Um, what's what's beyond SEO, and so those are those are some of the benefits to having a cross industry perspective, and having a broader view to be able to see things in a new light. Another way that you've really been open about seeing things in a new life is just 
the way that you approach startups. I love this quote you had where you said, you started a startup because you love what you do. Don't ever let the startup world take that away from you. Define your success and define your own happiness. Startups are supposed to be fun. Let's not forget that. It sounds so much better when you read it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, Michael, it's hard to hear that sometimes because we live in a world where it's the hustle mentality. Yeah. You know, don't sleep, make sacrifices, sleep under your desk if you're going to sleep. Right. <laughs> How do you put that into context for yourself and still find great success without sleeping under a desk and skipping some meals? <laughs> so I, I think there's nothing wrong with sleeping under the desk and skipping meals, but do it on your own terms is, is I guess what that quote means is a lot of times we, we get pulled into directions, we get influenced by what TechCrunch wants us to be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you should raise venture financing and if you can't at a certain valuation, then you're not successful. Um, and I think a lot of times the, the way that, I guess, traditional view of how media quote unquote influences the young has a similar impact in any industry and in, in startups specifically where success and failure is such a wide gap. Uh, and there's almost a right way and a wrong way of doing things. Just like how you said, you're supposed to walk into a room with a certain air of confidence and, uh, and be able to, to pitch your product in a certain way. And I think a lot of times those, uh, the things that we read, the articles that we read, you know, three things that successful people do, 12 things that... What to know, do before breakfast. Yeah. Yeah. Start, yeah. And that, that starts to define us in ways that sometimes uh, are genuine and sometimes we just do it because everyone else is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's nothing wrong with that, but startups is about the long game. Right? A, a lot of times, and I think that's a very important view, if you view startup as a get rich quick, like I'm going to go through these tough times because in a year I'll be swimming in money. Um, but of course, Not time and again, yeah. <laughs> time and again, you look at startups that are successful, they're founders who are ready to dedicate 20, 30 years to it because they're passionate about the problem. Uh, and it's the people who are willing to spend 30 years on a startup that ends up getting acquired within a short period of time. Um, because acquirers, investors, they see that passion, and that passion is what will carry the company through through the inevitable tough times. Because if you if you sleep under the desk on your own terms, nothing's going to pull you away, or nothing's going to discourage you. But if you sleep under the desk because it's something that LinkedIn Pulse told you to do, you're oh, going to have a hard that's time. Taking it too literally. <laughs> you're you're going to have a hard time. Um, you know, getting through the tough times, getting through the, the, the downfalls. Um, and it, it's really when you do things out of your own passion that you can go ride the waves and go through the difficult situations together with your team. So I want to ask you on that note then, Mike, and this is really just from more of a personal inquiry asking for advice. A lot of times you hear these stories like you said, of sleeping under the desk. And if it's on your own terms, that's cool. But it's really hard to not be influenced by that. And I have days where I pull back and say, no, like, it doesn't have to be a crazy routine. Like, this can still be done tomorrow. Right. But there's other days where suddenly my to-do list is literally the only thing I can think about. And I don't know how to pull myself back from that. How do you pull yourself back and say, hey, I started this for the long run and, and really go back to the whole, it's a marathon, not a race? Right. Um, I, I think experience is definitely a part of that. Uh, I, I, I was not anywhere near the way I'm thinking now in my first startup. It's, you, you fail a few times. <laughs> <laughs> you, you fail a few times, you succeed a few times, uh, and you, you can see the marathon because you've seen the race, right? Now, whether the race is longer or shorter, you've seen the life cycles of a startup, you've lived through it, you understand that sometimes things are out of your control, um, you know, market conditions, sometimes things change, and the startup can literally just fall apart at any moment, and that's part of the fascination for being an entrepreneur is you're always on edge, and it's kind of exciting in that sense. Uh, and you, you have to accept certain times, and again, with great discretion, that even if you do everything right, it may not work out. There's so many things at play. Uh, and, and the way I, I look at it is always from a, a bigger picture perspective, which is, yeah, I can, I can enslave myself for the short term uh, and really give it all I've got. But at the end of the day, even if I do that and everything is perfect, 
there's still so much timing and luck involved. And when it comes to timing and luck, the longer time you're trying to expose yourself to these opportunities, the, the more of a chance you're going to win the lottery, right? the same way as any kind of gambling goes. Time has a huge impact on whether or not you, you come across these glitches in the universe where things suddenly become wildly successful or terribly unsuccessful. Uh, and so the, the marathon view, I, I think, does come from experience. That's really the perfect way to segue into our last question on uncertainty, which is how I've been ending all the 33 Founders episodes this season. Mike, I admire you for saying that it comes with experience because I think a lot of times people say, well, no, I just always knew this. And no, you didn't. You went through the same <laughs> thing. You've made a lot of decisions so far in your career entirely and at Snipply to go against the grain. YC invited you back for another interview. You decided not to go. You've chosen not to have venture funding. You're not hiring like crazy when you could be. Each of these decisions is really risky, and you know that. So how are you sticking to your guns and going against the grain and not submitting to that uncertainty? Yeah, so... I mean, I, I just think there's a certain level of uncertainty with everything. And I think if you can see that, um, it would help. So, for example, venture financing isn't the a silver bullet that's going to solve all your problems. There's major risks involved in venture financing, too, which is um, your gut, it's not your company now. How do you generate a return on investment for your investors within three to five years to hundredfold your valuation? And that, having that on your board seat changes the direction of the company. And we're talking about the marathon in the long haul. Now you include a party who needs to get a 100x return or 10x return within three to five years. Well, I can't afford to take it slow and build a strong foundation. Um, so there's risks inherently in that as well. The same as Y Combinator. There's a risk in going to Y Combinator. A lot of people say, you know, get into Y Combinator whenever you can. But when do you get into Y Combinator? Are you going to spend the three months with these elites, founders, on, on building product market fit or do you go in with product market fit and use that time to scale and grow the company uh, and so uh, that was really our mentality around the second interview was you know what it's not like we don't like Y Combinator we love Y Combinator but uh, is it the right time we're trying to figure out these minor details product market fit and it'll take us three to six months to really figure it out whereas if we figure it out and go in the future, maybe when, when it's a more appropriate time for us. Same with venture finance. You know, if we have the foundation, why not take the money, scale it, and, and grow it very quickly? But there's risks even in the obvious choices. And I think it's important to look beyond what we know as good choices because the media tells us is the good choice uh, and see the risks in, in, in every option. And whether action or inaction both has its own risks involved. Just like how moving quickly, hiring fast, hiring slow, they all have inherent risks involved in them. So it's not like we're choosing a choice risk here. We're just taking a different set of risks than what most people do. That is the absolute perfect way to put it. And I will be honest, I very much needed that today because I was feeling very tied to my to-do list. <laughs> and you just really opened my eyes to a different way to approach things and still get things done. Can we close, Mike, with you sharing how people can stay up to date with you and start using Snipply? Yeah, Snipply, um, you know, Twitter, Facebook, we have, we have all of those. And, and quite a unique company name, S-N-I-P-L-Y. So if you search us anywhere, you should be able to find us. Uh, our domain is snip.ly, so S-N-I-P dot L-Y. It's got all the up-to-date information on what you can do with the product, what other people are doing with the product. And uh, there's a free account that you can just start. So... Uh, that's another thing that's always very important to us as well is give it away for free. And if they like it, they'll upgrade to the premium feature. So feel free to come on by. Um, as we talked about earlier, I spend a lot of like long hours <laughs> per day talking to every single email that comes through and responding. So anytime anyone has any questions, just shoot me an email at team at snip.ly, T-E-A-M at snip.ly. And um, either myself or one of my co-founders will be able to get back to someone within 24 hours. Perfect. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me.